evolution is not macro evolution. Micro, just variation with a kind. Macro, supposedly, the jump from one kind to another kind. But micro evolution is just variation within a kind. It's why dogs look different, people look different, but they're still dogs, they're still people. And microevolution, which is only variation with a kind, cannot produce macroevolution. Evolutionists cannot adequately answer the question, where did the original information that is being copied come from? I have defeated major evolutionists in debate simply by saying, please tell me, Professor so-and-so, where did the information we are copying come from? Because you've got to copy previously existing information, either perfectly or imperfectly. And no one has ever given me an answer to this question that will then prove that evolution is true. Finally, on this point, since 1910, we've done over 3,000 mutations that have been documented in fruit flies, yet there is no documentation of a fruit fly evolving into something else. We have done things to fruit flies that ought to be illegal. We have hit them with x-rays. We've hit them with oh, toxic chemicals. We've hit them with the heel of our shoe. We've done things to fruit flies that just ought to be illegal, immoral, and unethical. But the fact of the matter is, we've produced over 3,000 documented specific variations or mutations in the fruit flies. But they've never changed anything else. I mean, we have absolutely done things that are just cruel. I mean, we've had legs grow out through the middle of eyes. We've had, uh, well, we've had fruit flies with short wings, curly wings, no wings. I mean, what do you call a fly with no wings? A crawl? Let's think about this. This is a normal fruit fly here. This is a fly with curly wings, but it can't fly. This is one with short wings, but it can't fly. And, of course, one without wings can't fly either. And I'd like to share a quotation from the great evolutionist Pierre-Paul Grasset. Now, he's at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He wrote a book called Evolution of Living Organisms that was published in 1977. In that book, he said this, quote, The fruit fly, the favorite pet insect of the geneticists, whose geographical, biotopical, urban, and rural genotypes are now known inside and out, seems not to have changed since the remotest times. Well, he's just said, in spite of everything we know, every mutation we've made, we've never changed fruit flies into anything else, not in nature, not in the laboratory. Now, this is a biology textbook from 1996. In there is the electron micro photograph here of a fruit fly. But this fruit fly is interesting because it has a mutation with an extra pair of wings. Okay, so these are the regular wings here, but it has an extra pair of wings back there. Now, here's the thing. Uh, one evolutionist said, well, you know, the extra pair of wings would allow the fruit fly to fly at higher elevations. Fruit flies would be able to survive above 7,000 feet of elevation. The problem with that, of course, is that no fruit fly lives above 7,000 feet of elevation because they all freeze to death. And this fly cannot fly. It can only hop. And no normal fruit fly will mate with it. Well, so would this mutation be passed on in nature? Well, obviously not. Now, in the textbook, it says this. Normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four, as clearly seen in the picture. The textbook then says this. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. So even the textbook admits most mutations are harmful, although actually all are harmful. And then it says this in a very optimistic tone. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Well, here we're taking a look at survival of the fittest, but, uh, well, let's think for a second. This is not macroevolution. This is the accidental duplication of previously existing information. Is that correct? I mean, the information for wings already existed. Is that correct? This is just the accidental duplication of previously existing information. It's not beneficial. It's lethal. And the mutation will not be passed on into the next generation. And let's talk about vestigial organs. Now, Charles Darwin considered the existence of vestigial organs to be an absolutely essential proof to evolution. Now, what are vestigial and retrogressive organs? Well, vestigial means useless, no longer needed. Retrogressive means it was needed, but at the moment it's kind of on the way out. So vestigial, no longer needed, useless retrogressive, was once useful, now still partly useful, but on the way out. 
And Charles Darwin said that this was an essential proof of evolution. His reasoning went like this. He said, if an organ or a structure was still in a human vein, uh, that was also in an ape, and the structure was still useful in an ape, but was no longer useful in a human being. It proved that we had evolved past being apes, and we were now evolving into something new, some kind of a superhuman, and so these organs and structures that were no longer needed were phasing out, and new things were evolving. I mean, that's his concept. Now, I want to introduce you to Dr. Wiedersheim. In 1895, Dr. Wiedersheim, who was an evolutionary believing anatomist, wrote a book called The Structure of Man. In that book, he listed 186 organs or structures in the human body. There was 100 vestigial, no longer needed, and 86 retrogressive, partially useful, but on the way out. Now, on his list of 186 structures or organs in the human body that were supposedly no longer necessary, he included, well, vestigial organs, which no longer function. That would be no demonstrated function. In other words, vestigial means useless and retrogressive, an organ that is no longer required on the way out. In the book, he listed the pituitary gland. Now, first of all, if I take out your pituitary gland, you're going to die. He also listed the pineal gland, tonsils, wisdom teeth, human hair, small toes, coccyx, thymus gland, notochord, cord, appendix, well, and the little gland in your eye that produces sleep. He listed as just some of the 186. Now, for instance, if you don't think you don't need small toes, we'll be very happy to amputate them on the way out from the presentation, and you will have to learn how to walk all over again from scratch. Well, let's think here for a second. What about the appendix? I mean, you've all heard the appendix is a useless, functionless organ that don't need it and so forth. As a matter of fact, in this biology textbook here, it compares a human to a horse for some reason. I'm not sure why, but... Notice it says, compared with the cecum of a horse, the appendix of humans is thought to be vestigial, no longer needed. But this comes from a book called Fully Functional by Dr. Jerry Bergman. And, uh, quote, long regarded as a vestigial organ with no function in the human body, the appendix is now thought to be one of the sites where immune responses are initiated. As a matter of fact, today we now know that the immune system in babies is highly dependent upon the appendix. Notice that this is from New Scientist, an evolutionary publication. During fetal development and endocrine hormone-producing cells appear in the appendix. So during fetal development, endocrine hormone-producing cells appear in the appendix. These cells produce peptide hormones that control various biological functions. And this comes from Dr. Allard. The appendix is required to activate killer B cells in your immune systems like thyroid activates T cells. This is from Dr. Walter Brown. Its removal also increases a person's susceptibility to leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, cancer of the colon, and cancer of the ovaries. I don't know about you, but it seems to me like maybe the appendix is really worth keeping. And what about, uh, well, the coccyx? Now, People incorrectly call the coccyx a tailbone. Well, it's not a tailbone. It has nothing to do with a tail. Never did, never will. And, uh, well, here's a picture of the supposed tailbone, though that's not what it is at all. It's actually a very cleverly designed structure. But in Discover Magazine, June 2004, they said this, that it's all that's left of the tail that most mammals still use. Well, first of all, it was never a tail, and it isn't today. And here's another biology textbook. Notice here it says, humans have a tailbone with no apparent use. And then the textbook says, vestigial tailbone is in humans. Uh, these vestigial structures can be viewed as evidence for evolution. Organisms having vestigial structures probably share a common ancestor. That's evolution. Or from this biology textbook, again, concerning the, the coccyx or tailbone, it has no present function remainder of bones, long tail of a tree dwelling ancestor. They want to think people, just monkeys or apes. Actually, Charles Darwin said people evolved from monkeys. Uh, people would say he meant apes. I don't know whether he meant it or not, but he wrote monkeys. And let's examine the evidence. There is no genetic evidence for a method whereby useless organs will necessarily deteriorate. We've never found a mechanism that would allow for the deterioration of anything. 
the function of an organ may not yet be discovered. What if you have a vestigial retrogressive organ as their name?